one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world is coral reefs. Now, as we know, they are under threat right now due to coral bleaching, which is occurring due to rising sea temperatures, ocean acidification, the runoff from farming and on land. So there are organizations all across the world trying to work out ways to regenerate reefs. This is one of those organizations. I got a chance to speak to Coral Guardians um, a little bit about what is happening, how they're protecting the reef, um, why it's so important to regrow coral reefs, what technologies they use, and most importantly, how you can help the coral reefs, even if you're in a landlocked place. So if you're interested in this, there's going to be timestamps down below that you can check out specific topics. But yeah, I just wanted to bring you guys along onto the podcast journey, which you can also listen to in any of the streaming area devices things, or listen to it here on YouTube, because you guys are my ocean warrior YouTube peoples. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to click this. Um, I love hearing your feedback and I love being able to share some of the amazing people I've met through the process of making this podcast. So if you want to help me continue doing the work I'm doing, please consider becoming a patron. This video is actually sponsored by my patron, so thank you guys so much for um, being here with me and helping me do what I love and educating more people on how to protect our oceans. Uh, we get up to some really fun things on Patreon, so head on over there and check it out. And otherwise, let's get into the video. Every day there's a new news story about the crisis facing our ocean. Whether it's the plastic issue, overfishing, pollution, if the oceans die, we die. Fortunately, we have plenty of environmental activists, marine conservationists, and eco-warriors who are out there every day fighting to protect our oceans and our Earth. On the Ocean Pancake Podcast, we're going to be hearing from some of them about how to decrease our environmental footprint, go plastic-free, participate in ocean conservation, cleanups, and even maybe some marine science. So, welcome to the Ocean Pancake Podcast, where the goal is sustainability and living a turquoise life. My name is Kat Andreskova, and I'm your host today. Let's get into this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Ocean Pancakes Podcast. Today I have Coco here, who is the communication manager from Coral Guardians. Welcome to the podcast, Coco. Thanks, Kat. Very looking, really looking forward to this. I am so excited to chat to you because, as you know, coral reefs are one of the most important things uh, in our oceans. Uh, so let, let's get into this episode. How did this whole process start? How did you first fall in love with the ocean and get involved in ocean conservation? I suppose I was um, very lucky um, to spend my childhood in Kenya, going to the coast with my family and snorkeling um, from a really young age. So I suppose that's where it started. And then um, I've worked on different environmental projects learning about the importance of um, involving local communities in conservation. Um, I studied environment and politics in London and as a first job, I suppose Coral Garden was my first, my dream job, <laughs> as it really um, mixes um, social, environmental and scientific aspects in um, basically giving uh, local communities tools um, to manage their own local marine ecosystems and so here I am. <laughs> That's fantastic and so what is the work that Coral Guardians are doing? What is the mission? Well Coral Guardian, so Coral Guardians a French NGO that was founded in 2012. Um, we're a small uh, but very motivated team. We're four people working full-time in France um, with an amazing group of volunteers in France too and eight people working full-time in Indonesia. So since 2015, we've had our pilot project um, in Indonesia, near on Hataman Island, which is very close to Komodo National Park. And since then, we've been working in collaboration with fishermen and their families from a fishing village called Seraya Besar. 
And in this area, the problem was that people were fishing with dynamite and cyanide, so destroying um, the ecosystem they actually depended on for fishing. So they ended up having to fish further and further away from the village and it was um, got became dangerous. So our co-founders decided to launch this project um, with three main focuses in mind. Um, I suppose the first one is to restore coral reefs who've, that have been destroyed, but always by involving the local community with our transplantation technique, where we collect um, viable, well, we used to, from the, at the beginning, we used to collect viable um, coral samples from the seabed and then um, fix them onto solid structures so that they could grow again. Whereas um, now we've um, transplanted over um, 38,000 corals. So we've got um, a huge um, marine protected area that was actually officially announced last year. <laughs> oh, wow. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> thanks. And now we can actually collect um, samples from our own nurseries and transplant them onto new structures. And this area is entirely protected and managed by people from the village, um, the fishing village of Seraya Bessar. Um, our second focus is not just to restore the reef, but we've developed um, a participatory conservation model where, as I was saying, we involve um, both local communities um, to better manage their fishing resources with um, sustainable fishing techniques and different fishing locations, etc. And we also involve the international community as we've developed um, our, since the right since the beginning, since 2012, actually, we've, uh, since 2013, we've got an adopt a coral program where anyone in the world can adopt their own coral and we'll transplant it on our restore, our marine protected area um, the following month. And we've also got a raise awareness kit where um, anyone in the world could um, raise awareness with um, this quiz we've developed with a written speech and videos, etc., to spread the word. And our last focus <laughs> is um, we take part in scientific discoveries. So we've also so we also simplify uh, scientific articles every month, so they're more accessible and people can understand um, scientific subjects more easily. We monitor our coral reef scientifically every month, whether um, with biological, or social data, and, and fishing habits. And we'd also like to share this data to contribute to scientific research because um, we believe um, NGOs can really contribute to scientific research actually and it's um, not always the case at the moment. And we're also thinking in the, in the process of launching our own um, scientific and uh, research programs. Wow, so you guys have a lot of things going on at once. Yeah, that's why I would say we're a small but very motivated team. <laughs> That all sounds amazing, but I do want to go back to what you mentioned yeah. at the very beginning, right? So the initial catalyst of your founders uh, being motivated to create change, and that was the locals fishing with dynamite and cyanide. So for yeah. people who aren't aware of this issue, can you describe a little bit more about why were they fishing with dynamite? How did that look like? Because mm -hmm. that that just blows my mind, you know, that there's places in the world where explosives were used to catch fish. Yeah, well, I suppose it's a very efficient way of fishing in a way because you, um, by um, throwing dynamites um, in the ocean, you, you kill everything. And so you get a lot of fish and these fishermen weren't, fish, weren't using dynamite to destroy the ecosystem, but to feed their families. So they'd, They'd collect a lot of fish, but because they didn't understand the importance of what was happening below and the fact they were destroying the, the actual coral reef, which provides protection and food for um, the fish they actually need. Um, they, there was this vicious, vicious circle where they'd keep destroying um, to get more fish and feed their families, but in exchange they'd have to fish further and further out because they're, when dynamite hits a coral reef i mean it's complete rubble mm -hmm. there's no it's not like other i suppose other coral reef conservation projects in the world where it's to do with bleaching or whatever and you still have um solid like rock structures or the corals can actually be 
um, transplanted onto solid structures, natural structures, we've had to recreate the whole um, structure coral reefs can actually fix onto and then and grow again. How, how big of an area would a dynamite throw destroy? And like, how often could they do this? Did the fish come back? I'm just struggling to kind of imagine like how many years they were doing it and how it was even sustainable in that short time. Yeah, well, um, well, they did it for years um, and it wasn't sustainable. I mean, they've, they really had to very quickly had to move on to fishing in different areas and further and further out. So, um, no, it wasn't. I mean, I think some communities really struggle with having to fish out really far. Um, and it's yeah very hard for them to provide for their families. Um, and then the, the area is that's destroyed, it's hard to tell because it depends, I mean, how close the seabed is from you know, where you've thrown the dynamite, but it can destroy. I mean, the area we've recovered is um, the equivalent of about two football pitches. We've been trying to, but then it's hard to tell whether that was destroyed, um, how many dynamite sessions that yeah. and it was need, were needed for that, to be, that area to be destroyed. But I mean, a huge area was destroyed where we're working. Did you have a chance to actually speak to the locals about these practices, about, you know, why they were doing it or how, how is access to dynamite that easy? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose, I actually don't know, but I suppose in Indonesia, well, it clearly was easy because that was the, I mean, it still happens. It's illegal now in Indonesia, yes. um, but that's, we are, our team, um, they have they go through rounds, but um, there are always two members of our team on the island at night to to, to protect the area because um, dynamite, um, but also cyanide still, especially cyanide because it's silent. Mm -hmm. um, cyanide fishing still takes place um, sometimes. Um, when we speak to fishermen, they said um, it's it's much nicer for them to fish um, with a line because dynamite was also dangerous for them. Yeah, I've heard stories where um, fishermen lost their hand um, with oh, this geez. whole, I mean, it was really dangerous in, in every sense for the environment and for the fishermen. Mm -hmm. they'd, and they'd use it because it was, it was, it really was an efficient way of getting a lot of fish very quickly. Um, but now then, we were in Indonesia last summer. And we discussed, uh, we were talking with um, fishermen from, from the village we work with, Sehayabesa, and they were saying that, um, so the project's been, it has existed for about five years now. And in the past two years, they've been able to fish um, close to the village, which was unheard of for years. So we're actually analyzing our social data at the moment to, to have proper scientific, um, a proper scientific an analysis of all this, but um, fishermen seem to say that they're able to fish now in the area, which wasn't the case before, which we're hoping means our project is helping them. <laughs> which is an incredible result if it is the case. Um, but yeah. we've seen it in many other ecosystems, um, you know, whether it's land or sea, if creatures are allowed to, you know, be left alone and when they have that protection, whether it's like the wolves coming back to the national parks or sharks in marine ecosystems, it really actually brings up the numbers of the fish and then fishermen kind of benefit from it. Like I think one of the biggest examples is Raja Ampat, where um, yes. the fishermen are experiencing the overspill of the healthy reefs because it's all been protected there. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose that struck the difficulty with um, protected, marine protected areas is that often local communities have no access to them because it's almost only tourists can access them, whereas our idea was that um, this particular area was protected and managed by local people mm -hmm. and they're not allowed to fish on it but they're allowed to fish around and the whole aim of this project is that they can fish um, close by but not on so it's it's a virtu it becomes a virtuous circle yeah um and the cyanide so as you mentioned it it's a silent way of killing fish but do, do they just, is it tablets? Do they pour it in? What does that look like? 
Yeah, I've mostly heard of liquids. Um, like they have it in bottles and they mm -hmm. pour it in the water and then fish just pop up onto the surface. I mean, Jeez. again, it's, um, I suppose, very efficient in that way. But then obviously that we, the fish, um, yeah, have, I mean, must have some sort of trace of cyanide on them. And yeah, that can I mean, be good really for the people either. No, I, I mean, I don't know if that's proven, but I can't imagine it's that good for them either. So, um, yeah. That would be difficult. Um, and they might not be seeing the effects of, you know, th these fishing techniques on their family's health, but, you know, we never know what's happening in, in our bodies, I guess. No, exactly. And I suppose with all, I mean, it's the same with plastic. We didn't know that fish were ingesting plastic until mm -hmm. not that long ago and that we're also um, eating fish that might have plastic, microplastics in them, you know, so we, yeah. So this is uh, your, your first kind of mission was to stop the dynamite fishing and the cyanide fishing and empower these local fishermen to be part of the team to protect the area essentially and then hopefully benefit. How did you guys go about um, actually including them in this process? Did you have trouble in terms of language communication or education or what did that process look like? Yeah. Um, good question. Well, our co-founders, because um, they were living in Indonesia at the time, the language barrier wasn't really mm -hmm. a problem. But I suppose what was, um, I suppose what started was the economic benefit where we hired um, some of our, most of our team are um, from fishing or used to be fishermen or mm -hmm. are from fishermen families. So there was that economic interest at the start where they thought, okay, well, we've got these jobs, they're creating these jobs for us. Yeah. And then um, and then as the project went on, I mean, it was very obvious that as soon as you start um, transplanting coal underwater, fish come back immediately. I mean, you're, while you're transplanting, you've got fish surrounding you. So the effect, the effect is immediate. And I suppose that's where um, raising awareness was and um, trying to explain the importance of this ecosystem was really clear from the beginning. And our team then would go back to the village. And I suppose that also... Um, and told them about their work and how they could see so many fish and I think that's how it all started and now with the fishing actually getting better um, they've yeah they really understand how important this marine ecosystem is for them and their families that's fantastic I'm just I'm so glad that it's working and um you know that the locals are also benefiting because I feel a lot of NGOs and things kind of focus on bringing in tourists and you know volunteerism and people from overseas to help while the key thing is to really empower the local populations to be able to manage and um, benefit. Yeah well we've noticed it really because um, our co-founders also tried, tried to launch other projects in Bali to start with mm -hmm. and when local communities weren't open to the project then there was no point in keeping going because the project would never be sustainable if local communities didn't want to manage it themselves and protect their true. own area. So apart from yeah. the initial kind of a monetary motivation, was there any other things that you guys had to do? Like, did you guys provide education evenings and like um, get them certified in diving or are people there already quite water savvy? Yeah, well, well diving is because we, we actually have um, diving equipment and mm -hmm. um, they've, they've got all the kit for it, but they, they actually refuse to use it because they'd rather, they, they prefer to swim without, the, without oh, really? um, swimming palms and with, um, um, they, yeah, they're really good at, uh, with uh, free diving. That's great. So, they, <laughs> so it's very, yeah, very natural for them. Um, and then, but with the raising awareness um, aspect of things, we, we have an English teacher, mm -hmm. um, Ima, who's, um, who lives on Labuan Bajo, which is a, a, a town that's very close by. And she um, teaches English to kids because um, it's a very touristy area. Yeah. Um, but she teaches them through um, biology lessons on coral reefs. I mean, it's quite yeah, biology focused and... 
So we've got that side of things at the moment where she's working in um, different schools and teaching the importance of coral reefs. And we've also got um, Valentina, who's our um, tourism manager, because obviously we can't help tourists um, coming to our marine protected area. Um, we, we have no um, right of telling them <laughs> they can't come. Yeah. So we've decided um, to raise awareness there too. So we've got a boat where we can, our team can go out and um, raise, um, tell the captain, you know, warn the captains about the marine protected area. And there are some boys also along the, uh, a line of boys. And, um, because anchors can also destroy <laughs> our coral reef. And um, so, yeah, there's a whole um, system and all, our team is really organised to, um, raise awareness amongst many people as possible, whether it's locals or tourists or cat boat captains. That's fantastic. So that's the first part of your mission. The second part was, um, you know, spreading awareness and having people be able to adopt a coral or yeah. uh, download those speeches and all that. So can you tell me a bit more about that? How can people help out whether, you know, they want to maybe come see the project or they want to adopt a coral? What does that look like? Yeah, so um, when you adopt a coral on our website, you receive a, a personalised adoption certificate where you can give your coral a name. Um, it has a photograph, um, a GP, it's GPS locations, um, a photograph of the person who will uh, be transplanting it for you, um, a member of our team. And the, I mean, the adoption certificate is symbolic. It's, it's a nice present and um, it's, like, it's an, yeah great mm -hmm. symbol to keep with you to remind you that you remind you that you've contributed to the conservation project and then what we do is we'll transplant that coal um, on our marine protected area the following month and our team will um, make sure I mean we've got a few donators also um, contribute with a monthly donation after they've adopted the coal which mm -hmm. is any it could be any sum um, and that helps contribute to the scientific monitoring, um, taking care of our, the main, all the maintenance and our raising awareness projects. Um, and the kit um, basically came from the idea that lots of people contacted us saying we want to get involved, but we're you know we're oh, we're very far from Indonesia. We've got people who contacted from in contacted us from India, Europe, different countries in Europe and the states, etc. Um, and wanting to do something. So we developed this presentation that talks about which with a quiz with eight um, questions and answers um, about around coral reefs and ways you could act for coral reefs in your daily life. Um, and the speech is all written out so that you don't have to think about it. And you, you've got um, videos to help with your presentation. And we've got a few people have used it in um, schools or diving centers and it's a great little tool to share. That's amazing. So definitely recommend head on over to the Coral Guardians website to check that out and download that because um, education is one of the best things we can do, of course, to help promote um, all the other work that you guys are doing. Um, yeah. And the last part, of course, is replanting the reef. So you guys take coral fragments and then place them on areas of the reef. How do you decide, you know, what coral to transplant and where to take it from and where to put it? Yeah, great question. Um, well, we, we've always used um, autochthone species, I mean, species that have, were already existing um, in the area. We've never imported any. Any probably coal. a good I mean, idea. <laughs> coal, yeah, <laughs> the coal is always already the coal we found was already uh, existent. Our problem was that the, I mean, dynamite destroys the entire seabed. We, there's no nowhere a coal could um, grow again. So at the beginning, we'd find we'd find um, coal samples that had survived, and we'd transplant them onto um, these metal structures. Mm -hmm. um, and saw that that would grow. We've tried different techniques. We've tried um, rope and um, ceramics, etc. But in our area, there's quite a lot of current, so ropes didn't work. Um, I mean, for various reasons, we've um, we saw that the metal structures were the best because they really fix. They'd stay 
um, that keep the coal fixed for long enough so that the coal could grow and then um, take over. And recently we've actually, um, we're working on developing um, biomaterial structures, so mm -hmm. bamboo and um, metal. Sadly, we can't just use bamboo because it wouldn't stay, it would float. <laughs> but we're mixing both materials so that um, to reduce any type of environmental impact. But um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. I like that you're actually trying to find new methods of attaching it to the sea floors like bamboo, which is more eco-friendly than yeah. a lot of the, you know, foreign objects that people are placing in. Like um, you must have heard about when they when they placed all those tires in the ocean to create an artificial reef, and then years later they found out it was, you know, disintegrating and leaving microplastic everywhere. Ah uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. I suppose people <clears throat> people do their best to try and find some innovative ways of restoring coral reefs, but it's it's best to really um, think about what materials you're using and how this can also impact the local environment. It's really important. Definitely. And um, in terms of cor coral guardians, what do you believe are some of the biggest challenges our oceans are facing? I mean, you quite localized, you had the issue with, with the dynamite fishing and cyanide fishing, which is now illegal, which is fantastic. However, yeah. I'm sure it still happens a bit, but what other issues do you think is, are facing our yeah. oceans and our reefs? especially? Well generally um, I suppose it goes between like global warming clearly mm -hmm. affects and uh, human press pressure generally affects um, our oceans. Well sadly since the 1970s um, for, we've lost 40% of coral reefs worldwide mm -hmm. which is huge and um, I suppose uh, according to scientists if we if we don't act um, very quickly we could lose most coral reefs by 2050 which is also really soon um, uh, and um, losing coral reefs I mean that's losing a, whole, a quarter of all marine biodiversity depends on coral reefs for a living whether that's protection or food so that would be losing a quarter of all marine biodiversity too, too. so there's definitely um, yeah there's an emergency and we really do have to act now but I suppose our our message is that there are solutions and if we really think of all aspects whether you know including everyone in projects um, like ours um, we really can move forward and and find solutions but we really do have to act quite quickly yeah definitely do you guys see as like replanting the reefs as a viable solution considering the rate at which they're disappearing in many areas in the world? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, well, I suppose we've got, um, we've got really good results, which is positive. As I said, you know, we've transplanted over or around 38,000 coals. Um, we've noticed that there are 30.2 times more species of fish on our restored area. Oh, nice. So that's, um, that's a definite. Um, however, I'd say, I mean, replanting reefs can't just happen on its own to, mm -hmm. you know, save oceans. People definitely need to change their habits to help combat climate change and local communities definitely need to start understanding the importance of ecosystems they depend on for their livelihoods. Um, actually, we see coral reef restoration as a, as a tool to raise awareness, you know, whether locally or internationally, mm -hmm. it's really worked as a tool to raise awareness. We're obviously also restoring biodiversity, but um, uh, generally that's not um, the main aim. We are not going to be able to save oceans only by restoring and, you know, almost like catching up on other people's mistakes. We can't yeah. um, only do that. So, yeah, I suppose restoration combined with changing habits would be um, a perfect combination for nature to regain its rights and take over again. It is so, you know, um, inspiring though, to see that you are seeing change or positive change, even within, you know, six, six years, eight years now. Yeah, oh, wow, five, five years. Five years. Well, five years <laughs> on this project. Yeah, so it's really quick. 
so and tropical i mean hot tropical reefs grow um the corals grow from one to two centimeters a month so results are really impressive it's mm -hmm. um it is very quick and we've also i mean studies show that corals are building resilience in the face of rising temperatures but i mean those studies are still um in in process, no, yeah. In process, yeah. We can't really, <laughs> and it's too. It's almost too easy to say. Well, coals are resisting, so all everything's fine. I mean, it really isn't fine. We we really need to change, you know, our habits and and get involved with local NGOs, whether they're NGOs that focus on, you know, plastics or mm -hmm. um, you know, res restoration. It's great to get involved. I'm forgetting right now where I heard it, but it just, it really moved me. And it was that nature wants to grow and wants to heal. And it's like, like the human body, you know, and if it's left alone or if it's helped out, it's incredible what it can do. And I think your work is a really good example of that, how in five years, you know, you're seeing so much more life coming back to the area. And it is not only benefiting, you know, the ecosystems, but also the people and the local populations because I think in a lot of ways people people like to point fingers you know and blame humans for everything when yeah. in areas like that you know as as you were saying they weren't dynamite fishing because they enjoyed it and they were getting hurt and <laughs> you know it was dangerous but they needed to find food for their families and I'm sure the pressures of overfishing in other parts of the ocean would have trickled down that they felt the need to have these extreme measures um, to catch more fish um, and to yeah, provide exactly. that food. So it's about, you know, healing, healing where you can to benefit humans as well. And um, that's yeah, it's, exactly because it's too easy to see yeah. humans as villains and mm -hmm. think that they're, I mean, we've, we've seen this, it is a classic example of actually, just helping nature out a little bit has also helped out this entire community. I mean, this village has 750 inhabitants and the fact that you can actually provide for their families and through fishing still, I mean, obviously we haven't um, forbidden fishing as such, but just the fact that nature has come back means they're also benefiting from that. And I think that's a, that's a really important message. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, hopefully the, the fishing is just less, less disruptive. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Well, it really is. I mean, clearly, I mean, if it had been destructive, we wouldn't have 13.2 times more species of fish on our area. It's, um, yeah, Just it's, I mean, clearly we've got res the results. Yeah. Sorry. Are they allowed to use nets and spear guns and um, lines or is it restricted to any of those? No, they, um, this village um, always use lines. Okay. It's not, um, I don't know about um, what they are allowed to use, but that's what, naturally, that's what they're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just I know um, when I worked in Comoros in the Moheli National Park, uh, they also forbid dynamite fishing, but they also forbid spear fishing and net fishing. So they were only allowed to use lines. Um, okay, well, that might, yeah, that must be the case. It might be the case also. So I was just but wondering, they've always, you know, traditionally, they've always used... Um, They've always used line fishing anyway. F fair enough. So it didn't really change it that much. Just took away the dangerous dynamite. <laughs> yeah. And the potentially people harming cyanide as well. And who knows what kind of impacts that had long term on yeah. the environment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, just kind of wrapping it up. Um, where can people find you and get involved? Um, can you, what are all your... Yeah. social medias and such <laughs> yeah great well actually because um i forgot well i didn't mention it but if um we've also uh, last year launched our blue center program which is um, a free training program for anyone wishing to develop their own coral reef restoration project oh amazing um we're willing to accompany other um you know organizations or ngos who um whether theoret on the theoretical side or practical side on developing their own project. So mm -hmm. um, if you know of any um, coal reef restoration projects, I mean, do get them in touch with us. Mm -hmm. um, then we've, um, we've also got our Adopt a Coal program, program, obviously, which helps us raise awareness and achieve all our daily actions, whether with scientific monitoring or 
helping us contribute to launching uh, other projects around the world. And um, actually with this, um, through our Blue Centre training programme, we're currently launching projects in the Mediterranean Sea and the Caribbean Sea. Mm -hmm. So same if, um, if anyone hears of even like sponsors that are willing to help to develop those projects or willing to, to donate to help us launch those, we'd be incredibly grateful. And then do get in touch if you want to raise awareness too. We'd be really happy to share our kits with you with our quiz and videos. I'm going to go check that out. Um, that sounds Great. fantastic. Um, and to end the podcast, I just want to ask you the same question I ask all my guests, which is if you could give one piece of advice to someone who wants to protect our oceans and our earth, what would it be? Yeah, well, I suppose, um, well, beyond like obviously changing your habits and thinking about the way you eat and dress and everything, it's really important, I think, to, to think about all those things and reflect on them. Um, what I'd recommend is to get involved with and support NGOs in their actions because NGOs have all developed their own expertise on different topics and I think it's a great way to contribute to the environment and to get involved with them and um, help them in um, contributing to this expertise and I think we can all, um, I mean we've all got, we can all act um, on our little scale and do our best and I think this will have an impact on our oceans. Definitely. Thank you so much for taking the time out of uh, your busy, busy day, Coco, to chat to Thank us. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, been a pleasure. I, I completely forgot dynamite fishing was a thing. So thank you for <laughs> bringing that up. We haven't had it yet um, talked about on the Ocean Pancake podcast. So that's really fantastic. Um, well, great. <laughs> I'm glad it was of help. And um, yeah, thank you for the time. It's really great to be able to chat about these things and spread the word so yeah. thank you and once you know travel restrictions um disappear i would love to come and visit near komodo yes do you. i've been yes, definitely one of my must do's <laughs> do we'd actually be um launching some eco volunteering programs um with local organizations by the end of the year so do do join <laughs> perfect thank you so much uh and we'll chat Thanks, soon. Kat. yeah great What a pleasure to talk to Coco and learn all about coral guardians in Indonesia and, you know, have me dreaming about the days when we can travel again and hopefully get to see these beautiful coral reefs and how much they have regenerated and rejuvenated in five years. It still blows my mind how much our oceans can get better and fix themselves if given the chance. If you would like to help me uh, continue the work I'm doing, it would mean the world to me if you went to oceanpancake.com uh, where you can get all the show notes, of course, but also get yourself is a plastic is the killer t-shirt or support to the Patreon fund. All these things will help me be able to keep talking to incredible and inspirational people from all over the world, ocean conservation volunteers and more um, to bring you guys some ocean loving to your bedroom or gym or car ride or wherever you are and of course I want to say thank you to Graham Mode who is the magical musician mind behind the beats I have in this podcast he is truly incredible based in Brisbane if you live in Brisbane if the bars open up go see him live otherwise you can support him online Graham Mose he is absolutely incredible and yeah thank you thank you thank you so much hope you are having an amazing June, an amazing June ocean. Remember to use that hashtag uh, to support our oceans this June. I'll talk to you guys in the next episode.